Ladies and gentlemen, it's another pleasure being with you. I want to thank God for another opportunity to share on the members of the Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, with emphasis on the Holy Spirit. And for the message, the Holy Spirit is Jesus' counterpart on earth, working for the salvation of mankind and the maintenance of the relationship. Thus, Jesus warns that we should be careful not to harden our hearts against the Holy Spirit. And I'm setting the precedence, the precedence for the introduction. The three God personalities, the Father, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit, involved in our salvation, are of the same realm, the highest heavenly realm or sphere. Automatically, they have superior status to angels, mankind, and beasts. As such, angels, mankind, and beasts are limited. Boundaries are set. Thus, we cannot use our various credibilities to validate God. On the contrary, the Father, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit validate themselves in us through creation, personal testimony, and scripture. So we're going to take a brief view of the different members as they appear singularly by themselves. And then the emphasis will be on the Holy Spirit. So the physical evidence of the Father. Now the Father is all authority, knowledge, wisdom, work, and grace. And we actually get that from Jesus um, where he said, he, you know, he asked his Father for everything and he humbled himself towards his Father and so forth. Now in this picture there we see Moses um, receiving the commandment of God, from God, on Mount Sinai. We see God, the hand of God, um, actually, we didn't see it, the hand of God wrote it, wrote the commandments, and we see Moses outstretched, with his outstretched hand, to receive the commandment from the Father, who set up the management system for the covenant relationship um, of salvation on earth in his choice of the children of Israel. Now, Moses really wanted to see more of God, and Moses asked God to show himself. And we find this in Exodus 33 21. And so God told Moses he would pass by. And the scripture says, and the Lord said, Behold, this there is a place by me, and thou shalt stand upon a rock, and it shall come to pass, while my glory passed by, that I will put thee in the cliff of the rock, and will cover thee with my hand while I pass by, and I will take away my hand and thou shalt see my back parts, but not my face. All right? So this is a singular experience with the Father. Okay? Now, let us look. And Moses actually had a lot of experiences, you know, with God. But as I said, we're just passing over because my main emphasis will be on the Holy Spirit. And then look at the physical evidence of Jesus, as an example. Now, the gospel and Hebrews 
show Jesus as a man in human flesh who took on the nature of the first Adam who was God's son. Better qualifying himself as our high priest in the heavenly sanctuary. The heavenly sanctuary highlights the following. Forgiveness of sins. Prayer. God's daily provision of physical needs. A lifestyle of holiness in character. An individual responsibility in judgments. And Jesus demonstrated these attributes on earth for 33 years. And with emphasis on the last three years in his ministry. Then he died for mankind. Mankind's sin. Solving the problem. Was buried. Resurrected. And return to heaven. When we get to the sanctuary in the Old Testament, this will be emphasized again the sanctuary. So there we have in the photo Jesus, he died, he was born, he grew up. So he was a physical person in the flesh. You could have seen him. All right. He lived, well, most of his um, early years, he was in hiding until he emerged um, in, in his adult years. And for three years, he did ministry teaching the values of the kingdom of God. And also, um, mingling with the people, he was able to qualify himself to be that better high priest having taken taken on human flesh then he died which he, uh, as a result solving the sin problem we're going to see that when we get to the sanctuary again and he was resurrected and then he went back to heaven all right and his ascension in the book of Acts 1 9. And the apostles were encouraged that the same Jesus will return in like manner as you see him go. So these were all physical evidence that the eyes have seen. Now let's look at the Holy Spirit. Physical evidence of the Holy Spirit. Now, first. Um, the Holy Spirit is first seen, eh? moving. Actually, the Holy Spirit is not a visual quality like you can see the flesh and blood. Um, the Holy Spirit is, is compared to wind. All right, that is why I have nothing. All right, the Holy Spirit, you know, I make no noise. I have nothing. The Holy Spirit is compared to wind. We first saw the Holy Spirit moving upon the waters. In creation according to Genesis 2 the Bible says the Spirit of the Lord moved all right and the Holy Spirit is seen in the Old Testament moving mightily so when we as three days to the Holy Spirit we only see the evidence after the Holy Spirit is seen mightily is moving mightily upon leaders prophets and individuals to do great exploits Preserving faith through the ages. You know, when the Holy Spirit comes or came on them, they became the men of different hearts. All right? And, and they had a lot of dunamis, a lot of power, and exousia. All right? Now, the Holy Spirit is also seen as a force from heaven, a dove, sorry, as a dove from heaven descending on the head of Jesus. At his baptism and um, at that period of time in Matthew 3 16 we saw the conversion of all three members at the same time we had Jesus who was in the water baptized being baptized by John so he was there singularly then we had the Holy Spirit coming down as the dove singularly 
and then we had the voice of God, the Father, speaking from heaven. This is my beloved son. Hear he him. So we see the three of them singularly. In the book of Acts, on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit is seen of, as tongues of fire from heaven. It's just like shape of the tongue, tongues of fire from heaven, lightning on the heads of the disciples, empowering them to preach the gospel to all nations. And on that assembled day, there were members from all different parts of the world um, assembled. So they all heard the gospel in their own tongue which was a rather mysterious and joyful thing. And 3,000 people were baptized on that day. So when the Holy Spirit is present, you see the evidence all right, of it. And then we have personal testimony in the life of the repentant sinner. As a matter of fact, the personal testimonies are really one of the greatest um, evidences of the Holy Spirit. When you actually see what is done in your life, nobody can contend that because it's an experience that you have. It's, it is powerful. Let's look at the universal presence of the Holy Spirit. Now, Jesus had made mention of himself being limited. You know, um, being of the flesh while he was on earth. Amen. He spoke this with his disciples. But he promised that after his return, he will, well, he will pray the Father that he will send them another comforter or another helper. And that helper will be with them forever. And that is in John 14, 16. Now, according to the Greek, the Greek term that is used for that comforter is parakletos, meaning one called para means alongside, one called alongside, or one appointed alongside. Okay? So, God is with us and in us and near us available to all in a real way in the new covenant contract via the Holy Spirit. So now I want to explain or discuss the new covenant and where we see the Holy Spirit comes in highly into the picture. Explaining the change Explaining the change in function and setting with the new covenant which introduces the Holy Spirit to mankind as opposed to the old covenant. All right, so here we have the old covenant and in the picture, God in the Old Testament, OT means Old Testament, earthly sanctuary. Now, Israel held the salvation covenant in the Old Testament that brought forth Jesus for the fulfillment of the prophecy pertaining to salvation, Jesus being the Messiah. So let me just explain all um, what the picture represents. So this here in the center, and with the right going, white going all around the white border, that is the the sanctuary, the earthly sanctuary, made after the pattern of the heavenly as God gave to Moses. Now, 
The sanctuary was central to the community of Israel. You see, all of Israel, all the tribes, they are stationed around the sanctuary, and the sanctuary is in the middle. Now, although it was central to Israel, sanctuary central to Israel, it was limited in sphere to the world. Now, the sanctuary had three um one two three divisions we had the outer sanctuary where sacrifice daily sacrifices were taking place and, and of course you had the um for the daily we had the sinner will come with the lamb or the animal and the priest will give them the knife the sinner will confess his sin on the animal and here we have the burning of the sacrifices and we see the smoke going up so then so this happens on a daily basis on an annual basis there we have the atonement all right which will take place in the most holy place so um I will come to it. So the outer sanctuary we have the sacrificing of the animals controlled by the priests. And then we have the most the holy place. The holy place contains the table of showbread, which um the symbolism for God's daily provision. We had the incense um which to which prayers were ascending and we had the candlestick um and it put light into the sanctuary and of course the candlestick will represent more than that because in the book of revelation we see seven churches and we see the seven candlesticks so this was the holy place now here in the center the priests they will wash before they move into the holy place and then we have the most holy place which is the third the compartment and it is separated by a veil okay and that's a very important um, um object the veil because we're going to talk about it later and in the most holy place we had the ark of the covenant right and this is where god dwell this is where the um the high priest um, will enter and make the annual sacrifice uh, for the atonement of the whole community. All right? Now, God dwelt in the ark. The presence of God was in the ark. And um, God also, this is where communication also took place um, for the community. So, everything was basically limited to the community of Israel, but there was, you know, so now change in terms of the new change would be take, taking place, change took place in the outer region where sacrifices were done and in the most holy place where the atonement was done because the daily sacrifices and the atonement all pointed to Jesus who would have come and be the substitute lamb. All right? So, we have Jesus at the hour of Jesus' death. The hour of Jesus' death put an end to the animal sacrifice and the priestly atonement for sin. Okay? Because everything was pointing to Jesus. That was why the system was set up. Alright? But when Jesus came and he fulfilled the prophecy as being the Messiah, that section, these two sections were greatly affected in terms of change. So we have 
the new covenant and the Holy Spirit. In the new covenant, we see that new covenant talked about in the book of Ezekiel 36, 26 to 28, where God says he will remove our stony hearts from us and he will give us a heart of flesh and he will put his spirit within us and he will cause us to walk in his ways. So now in the new covenant, the seat of God's residency is transferred to the individual heart as opposed to the Old Testament where the abiding presence of God is limited to the most holy place in the earthly sanctuary. Now this new setting and function is achieved via the Holy Ghost, providing a universal presence and reach to both Israel and the Gentile nations, grafting them into the universal call to everlasting life. The renting of the veil or the tearing of the veil at the hour of Jesus' death provides such evidence. So here we have the tearing of the veil on the day or the hour of Jesus' death. The, the veil was torn from top to bottom. And we see the priests, you know, um, in a very dramatic stance because um, it, it's a fright, it could have been a very frightening experience, you know, just being in the presence and then experiencing the tearing of that veil. All right, it's a mysterious thing that happened. Now, no priest was needed to intercede anymore on behalf of the sinner. No sacrificing of lamb, no atonement. Jesus Christ at that hour was the atoning sacrifice. He was a sacrificial lamb that everything pointed to and that was one of his main purpose of coming to earth. And as such, he was qualified to be a better high priest for us. So the new covenant now being transferred to the heart puts the setting of the body as being a holy temple for that Holy Spirit to dwell. According to 1 Corinthians 16, 19 and Ezekiel 36, 26 to 28. So communication via the Holy Spirit and character are important values there for the individual because the lifestyle now has to accommodate that Holy Spirit so we cannot live any old how because of that. Now, if that if there was no change, if no change in the Old Testament system was done after the death of Jesus, then the system could have become idolatrous. The symbolism of the object and the priesthood could be held, held on to while the essence was passed. And so we have to be careful and that in itself might have contributed to the reason why the Jews were, well, certain Jews, Jews are particularly the Jews of the synagogue of Satan who must have held on to the transition because we saw in the, in the book that they did not believe and they told bad stories that Jesus Christ did not resurrect and so forth. And so in the attempt at keeping the system, they actually destroyed themselves in the system. And um, 
So they end up to be prosecutors of the Christian faith to begin with. And there might be one of the reasons why they would have aligned themselves with Rome as well to continue that persecution and to hide that story of the fulfillment of the prophecy. So Jesus now in the heavenly sanctuary, having gone back, being qualified, having qualified himself to be our better high priest, calls, come boldly unto the throne of grace and find mercy and find grace in time and help in time of need. Hebrews 4, 16. So we don't have to go to anybody now. You go straight to God. And so the new relationship is between heaven and the human heart via the Holy Spirit. Very quick, very efficient, universal application. Anyone can call at any time. So when Jesus, now this picture represents a representation eh, of Jesus knocking at the hard door. So um, so when Jesus Now this song, the title of this song is Jesus the Loving Shepherd. Alright, so when Jesus Jesus walks through the Holy Spirit. Through the Holy Spirit, Jesus is saying, you do not have to go searching a wanderer. I am right here at your heart door. Your body is now the setting for God's sanctuary and hurt on earth. It particularly emphasis on the receipt of your heart. Many people we do not understand this factor and it is there that we put up our battles. We put up our forces at great length to fight back because we think that we are doing ourselves a good play, not understanding that it is God that is knocking at our hard door wanting to establish that relationship with us and so the Lord knocks and he says oh wanderer you do not have to go searching I am right here at your hard door turn the door knob and open let me in as a guest, a big brother, a friend, a spouse, a parent, a counselor, a security guide, a teacher, a guide, your savior. And you can put whatever your need is. And I want to emphasize that this Jesus and the working of the Holy Spirit in us is not just about our salvation. Many times we put that limited sphere and we leave God out in the rest of our affairs of life. So we cut it like a piece of cake. But the relationship is the whole cake. Whatever your need is, God wants to fulfill that in you. He wants to show you his loving kindness 
and his care. All right? So just remember this. God wants that relationship not just to, to be that you accept him as your savior, but he wants to go through with life for you. The paraclete, giving you that Holy Spirit, that Holy Spirit that is there, going alongside on a daily basis, everything that you have need of, all our concern, our worries, God wants to be in it with us and to carry us through. Okay, he's not far from us. He's right near through the presence, the universal presence of the Holy Spirit. So let us see. Let us look now at the preparation of the Holy Spirit. For the Holy Spirit. The preparation for the Holy Spirit. Now we see this preparation in the book of Acts. Jesus being assembled together with the apostles or the disciples i think it was 120 of them um he commanded them that they should not depart from jerusalem but wait for the promise of the father that was after his resurrection just before his ascension when he met with them and that promise was the promise of the holy spirit because he is going to go now leave them and so they have no more presence with them. So that Holy Spirit is going to come, right? So he told them to wait, but they had to prepare. Um, there were 120 of them, according to the book of Acts, in the upper room. And they were of one accord, right? They were in, they were in agreement of what should be done, and they did things together to achieve their goal. Um, they, you see them having their sins forgiven, we saw prayers and Bible study or study of the scriptures, fasting, overcoming weaknesses, and mission readiness. Um, that has to do with gospel outreach. We saw them um, replacing the loss of Judas with Matthias. Okay, so this preparation was necessary. The Holy Spirit, remember, it is in, it has to come. In. Um, that presence of God coming into the heart so that the heart must have the readiness for the abode of the Holy Spirit. And so then we saw that Spirit coming in the book of, on the day of Pentecost. Okay? We talked about that before. Now, I want to emphasize that the Holy Spirit cannot be coerced for personal benefits. You know, we, we saw, um, I saw two instances. There were more instances, but I could recall two instances in the book of Acts where um, there was once a blacksmith. He, he, you know, he was converted and he saw Paul and Silas and you know, Paul and Barnabas and so on going about healing and so forth. So he wanted that, that spirit, that power. So he offered to buy it. And then we had um, Ananias and Sapphira who talked to trick or lied on and to the Holy Spirit and they lost their lives. Um, we also, that's something I'm observing, um, persons see people who are called and gifted by the Holy Spirit for the work of the gospel. And some people, they, they are jealous and they are attacking because they don't understand. They don't understand. They are responding to spiritual things with a fleshly nature and as such creating problems. So the Holy Spirit cannot be caused for personal benefits. We need to understand that. And now let's look at some work of the Holy Spirit. Um, it's a few well, but that's not the only. But we have the Holy Spirit intercedes, interprets our need, sorry. The Holy interprets our need and intercedes to the Father on our behalf. And we find that in the book of Romans 8, 26 to 27. That is one of the most gracious scriptures 
that you can ever read. It really touches the heart. It says that we do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Holy Spirit with groanings intercede to the Father on behalf of us. And um, many people, I can testify of those experiences. Um, the Holy Spirit gives joy. Yes, Romans 14, 17. Joy in the midst of sorrow. God can make you laugh and have your life light. And the Holy Spirit brings thoughts to memory. John 14, 26. So when we read the Bible or whatever it is that we have in our mind that God wants to use in a particular situation to bring us to awareness or to help us or to give messages, God actually taps into the source that is already there. That is why we are encouraged that we should study the scriptures and our thoughts, we should also fill our thoughts with healthy things, all right? Because the Holy Spirit will really use it to communicate as well. And the Holy Spirit gives power and direction to preach the gospel for Thessalonians 5. All right, well, you can see the scriptures. The Holy Spirit convicts of sin, righteousness, and judgment. All right, the Holy Spirit unites the church or the believers in fellowship. All right, now the Holy Spirit is supposed to be among the members of the church board when the decisions are making place. But sometimes that is, and sometimes it is not, because you can have decisions godly decisions overcome by fleshly nature due to prejudice and other instances so i i want to be careful with this one and the holy spirit gives spiritual gifts yes um for the blend out of the church and um for our own um benefits too you know you call on god and you have need and the lord gives you the need what we need to understand is the need is for service and not for all or, or, or personal aggrandizement so you know we, we don't take the things that god give us and exploit others with it you know we honor god by service the holy spirit brings the sinner to maturity by overcoming weaknesses. Yes. And that is a progressive thing. Eh? And we have to be patient and tolerant with people. Because people get to different stages of development at different points. And there are some who never get to higher developments in the spirit. They live and die in the fleshly nature. So... You have to be very patient as well because you will all once you have to deal with a mix of spiritual and fleshly you always have a lot of problems so the person who is called of god into ministry really have a lot of work to do and a lot of burdens to carry because of this mix you know this creates a kind of conflict which is like poison to the bone sometimes but we have to be patient and therefore that's the reason why we have to all to be praying to god for direction as to what we should do and how we should go because we cannot deal with people as we perceive that we must deal with them because of how we are we have to depend on god because god is in charge of the people so we must pray and ask god for direction the holy spirit gives information and reveals god's secrets that's very important a lot of the times you know people think that they can hide from god not god they can yeah yeah they hide from god too but they hide from others and they are very secretive and they plot and do things not realizing 
that God can tell, he can tell his prophets, his um, call out ones, his ministers, etc., and parents and so on, people who depend on him deeply, he can show them and does show them what other people are doing. Sometimes he takes initiative in our defense, even when we don't even know what is going on. But sometimes he shows and he shows us, I think down the road we see two dreams and stuff like that. And even the, the presence of the Spirit even sometimes talk. And then he talked to us with songs and so forth. So we cannot really hide from God. Psalm 33 says that, you know, God looks up from heaven and he sees all the deeds of the children of men. It is just our human folly that make us think, or the, our lack of eye salve that make us believe that we can actually hide and we can be good experts at blocking, you know. And Holy Spirit foretells the future in dreams and visions. That has to do with prophecy. Right now, that's a major thing for us as we come down to the end of time. Prophecy is very important, particularly um, Revelation 13. All right, which evidences of which we are seeing concerning the developments concerning the mark of the beast. And then we have... The Holy Spirit gives words to speak in times of need. Yes, God tells you what to say when you need what to say. So in terms of persecution, we have one that the Spirit of the Lord will tell us what to say. So one does not have to worry himself or self out and even plan all these. You know, we, we don't deal with God as we deal with business. You know, business, you have all your plans and projections and so forth. But that is not how it is with God. With God, you go empty. you empty. But you have a clean inside with a readiness to be filled. That is how you go with God. And the Holy Spirit bears witness to Jesus as the Messiah. Very, very important. Because it is upon such our faith and our salvation is built. So it is the Holy Spirit that convinces us of that. And then we have the Holy Spirit teaches truth. Jesus and John talks about that. The Holy Spirit teaches truth. So you see, the things that we, when we have all these arguments and so on, is because people are not really seeking God's Holy Spirit or not praying about things that they have confusions of, you know. They're looking at philosophies of men. But when you have your crisis moments, and it's because you're thinking that these things happen, so they're normal to development. What you do is, you put them before God, and you leave them there, and you go about your business. The Lord will address the situation and arrest your attention to receive it when the moment is ripe, you know. And the Holy Spirit comforts. Yes, really. Jesus, Jesus, the touch of God is so wonderful, so gentle. You know, it, it is it is Jesus is a gentler being than humans. You know? Um the Holy Spirit evokes honest. And holy fear for God. Yes, that the Holy Spirit will do that. Cause you to have reverence and have respect as well for others and to value them. All this thing is important, you know, because human beings were born created in the image of God. So when we have respect for God and fear for God, we will also have respect for others. And we will set our boundaries so that we will determine in our minds that we will not sin against them. All right? So most of the time when we have all these abuses and different things, it's because people have no respect for God. They don't have no respect for God because they have no awareness of the power of God that is available to them. They lack the teaching from birth. All right? 
and so. But, but we still have to be patient and treat them with kindness so that the Holy Spirit can find a path to touch them. You know, we still have to do that, not just go on the road to condemnation. We still have to do that. The work is greater because there is little that, that they have, but with that little, when we add the touch and the compassion of God in their life, it will woo them to come to God's side. But when we prong them down and pressure them and, you know, deal with them in very punitive ways, they, they, are, they are hardened. They become even more hardened. Okay, so we have to, like, till the soil, make it um, fertile, just like how we are um, doing in our agricultural processes so that we can get food. And we know we can get good production from very bad soil if we put good agricultural uh, processes there. Um, the Holy Spirit selects persons to the gospel ministry. That's another thing. It's not a choice of man. The Holy Spirit selects. So, the, and God gives power and authority to live the Christian life. The Holy Spirit gives power and authority to live the Christian life. The Holy Spirit also sanctifies or makes the life holy. Okay? And that is something that God does when you're not watching. When we are not watching. So now let's look at our conclusion. With the universal presence of the Holy Spirit in the plan of salvation, the universal presence means that God can reach each one at any time, at any place. God is not limited to time and sphere through the presence of the Holy Spirit. Um, because the, the sanctuary is um, setting in the new covenant is in the heart so we carry it along with us so with the universal presence of the holy spirit in the plan of salvation god can reach and administer services to the individual anywhere and anytime the holy spirit is not limited to boundaries as jesus was while he was on earth the holy spirit works to one's conscience according to Romans 9 1 thus one should be careful to build a culture of transparency for the Holy Spirit to act as we saw in the preparation for it in the book of Acts 1 for Paul counsels in Hebrews 3 12 to 15 that we should not harden our hearts against the ruins of the Holy Spirit. The gift of the Holy Spirit to earth in administrating the call to eternal life seems to be the second most compassionate act of God towards mankind, Jesus himself being the first. So, Jesus, the loving shepherd, calls thee through the Holy Spirit. And he says, Jesus, the loving shepherd, call thee now to come. into the fold of safety where there is rest and room come in the strength of manhood come in the morn of youth enter the fold of safety enter the way of truth lovingly tenderly calling is he wanderer wanderer come unto me patiently 
standing there waiting I see Jesus my shepherd divine Jesus the loving shepherd ladies and gentlemen let us thoughtfully appreciate and surrender our lives in gratitude for all of what heaven has done for us and will continue to do for us until the second coming of Jesus. Jesus wants to be with us through the presence of the Holy Spirit. The Father has set it up and so the Son Jesus has showed us and he has not left us alone but he has given us his Holy Spirit to take us through along with the other heavenly beings of angels. So may God be with you and bless your life and strengthen you as we all meditate and think of our relationship in Jesus. Thank you until we see again.